Hello everyone, welcome to the CEO Club. Today I have a very special guest with me. Uh, this is Mr. Shabir, the CEO of Akbas. Shabir, how are you doing? You okay? I'm fine, thank you. Thank you for having us here. Um, yeah, nice to be here. This is a great honor. This is the first time Shabir has ever been on an exclusive uh, podcast, a full episode podcast. So I'm looking forward to diving in and uh, trying to pick your brains. You're very well known throughout the country. And uh, this has been one of the most sought after podcasts that we've had. I've been trying to get this organized for a very long time. So I'm excited. That's scaring me now already. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're going to take it nice and okay. easy. I've got a lot of uh, things to get through. Rosa's going to open in one hour. So I need to yeah. try and get through as much as I can do before then and oh. give as much value as we can to our listeners. So the Rosa break could be a saving grace. Yeah, yeah hopefully. It might be half time. It might finish. It might be half time. <laughs> we'll have to see how we get through this. Okay. So where I want to begin is uh, I want to take you right back to your childhood and I want to talk about what life was like growing up for you. Okay. Um, I came to England when I was seven years old. My father worked in the textiles as most sort of Pakistani uh, kind of that, that generation was, a lot of them were, especially in Brentford, textile workers. Um, we grew up in a sort of what we call two up, two down terrace houses. That was a kind of general um, how most of us lived at that time. And it was a very good childhood because not just that time, I think any time. Childhood is probably the best time for anybody uh, in any generation of any era because it's the only time that you have no responsibilities, no overheads, no headaches, you know, worried about many things. All you're concerned about is your food, um, your sleep, and probably a little bit of stress about school, and that's it. So childhood was really good. Um, I, I enjoyed my upbringing. Um, we wasn't as privileged as what a lot of the people and a lot of the kids, and especially kids in our family are now, but it was still, a, it, it, was, it was a nice, it was a happy home. Yeah, would you say you were born working class then, or what did your parents do? Yeah, my father was a textile worker here, but before that, we're uh, from Pakistan. We're a family of farmers. We have our own land, and we farm that land. We live off that land. Um, so generally, yes, we were working class. Were you born and brought up in Bradford then, or did you move uh, to England? I moved here uh, with my mum when I was seven. Okay. Um, so kind of pretty much got into the schooling and education here at pretty young age and, and, and sort of ad adjusted to that quite quickly. Yeah, and what is it that your mum and dad did then? Yeah, my dad worked in the mills. Um, he was in a textile mills. Mum was a housewife. She stayed at home. So as most of the women were. At that time, um, in the mid-70s, that's when we arrived, um, there wasn't a lot of culture for Asian women working or driving or any of yeah. those things. So okay. most of the women... And pretty much girls were housewives. What was your thoughts on it moving forward now and how it is now versus back then? Obviously, the question it always is, was it better then or, or sort of better now? Um, well, for example, I okay, let me give you an example. So, for example, I've got a, a dozen restaurants. Yeah. And, and, the, and the business, for example, this one, Durani's, this is probably one of what I've invested the most of my money. And I've invested it for one of my daughters. So really, in context, would somebody have done that 50 years ago? No. Would we do it now? Yes, we do. And we understand that, you know what, there's no difference between daughters and sons. Um, actually, in some cases, they can be even better. I think daughters always have tend to have a bit more loyalty towards the parents, to the family, than the sons. And I don't blame the sons. I'm not having to go at them. But they've got their own careers. They've got their own wives and kids. They've got, they want to make their own mark on, on the world. And they want to sort of do their own thing. And I get that. We all did that. We, that's how we grew up. So, so yes, so it's a massive change from what the general uh, understanding was from then to now. That's good. That's interesting. And it's always good because on a lot of podcasts you see uh, sort of men and women all fighting each other and trying. There's always a podcast that go viral for the wrong reasons. But for a CEO like yourself to push out the message that women can equally succeed in business just as much as men. That's a powerful message to be putting out there. Yeah, of course. And, and I, I firmly believe in that. I firmly believe in that. You know, so long as they're astute and they have a good understanding, um, why not? And you just mentioned you bought uh, Durani's for your daughter. Just for context, uh, this is the jewellery store that you own. Yes. Um, this idea came kind of... This, this was a pub 
that uh, we bought because the car park came with it maybe sort of 15 years ago. Yeah. I'd never had no interest in the pub. Um, I just wanted the car park. And then sort of sort of just pre-COVID, um, I wanted to do something with it. I put a to let sign. So you can imagine every restaurant stroke, chawala <laughs> and tea place wanted to come and rent it. But I didn't want to give it to somebody who um, was going to sort of use and block my car park. Because I need yeah. that for my restaurant across the road. It's a very busy place. So parking was essential. And we was just sort of across the road with uh, a few of my friends. Uh, one of them who happens to be my partner here in this business, Havard Rani, uh, who had a small shop on Toller Lane. Um, it was a much smaller uh, shop. Uh, he wanted to expand. And uh, he's seen the sign to let. And he says, look, come on, why I want, you know, let's talk about it. Let's see if we can do something here. I says, yes, of course. Um, I'd rather give it to a jeweler because I know at, at 6.30, 7 o'clock, he's going to be home. Yeah. Car park's mine. Happy days. Um, but I says, you know, I'm subject to a couple of conditions. And I says, the most important condition, which he kindly, very kindly obliged, I says, I don't want another typical Asian jewelry shop. I says, I can't. St- I, 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 I says, that's not going to work for me. I said, it's got to look like a jewellery shop from the high street for New York or London, Paris. It cannot be a jewellery shop, an Asian jewellery shop yeah, think from Bradford. I says, I, I says, otherwise it's not of any interest for me. MashaAllah, Allah Ta'ala has blessed me a lot. But I want something that I can be proud of as well. Howard was a fantastic, and he is a fantastic jeweller. His knowledge on jewellery is unbelievable. His designs are exceptional. But my strength is this bit. Yes. What the shop looks like, the colours, not the million lights and mirrors and killing, <laughs> not that. Yeah. So this is what I want. It, so we work well together. Looks he beautiful. He does his bit and he has now customers here, which he, my, own, my daughter and Haber run together. So now haber has got customers here from all over the country. Our, ta- or should I say, our, yeah, our customers here are not just local. They're from all over. Manchester, Birmingham, Glasgow, um, Luton, Leicester. Because the designs that we have here are very exceptionally different. It looks beautiful when you come in here. It's completely different to any other store in, in Bradford, most definitely. Yeah. And I, I wanted people, this is the kind of shop that I wanted to sort of envisage, and, and, and I did envisage, and I said, however, I want people to come, sit, relax, offer them tea, coffee you know make them feel that they're in make them feel special and and that special feeling has to start from outside so uh there was one particular great jewelry shop which i'd seen in uh on fifth avenue in new york and it always struck me you know with the with with the pillars and the apex at the front and and that to me was the most iconic and i'd never seen a jewelry shop like it so i says to jeff my designer i says we listen I want the shop to look in this particular way. I want it to be inspired um, by those kind of shops. And, uh, and the rest is history. Yeah, mashallah. So I'm going to come back to Durrani's in a second. We've, uh, we've skipped the Akbar's section, so I'm going to go right back to your teenage years and what life was like for you in terms of your education. Did you go to uni? Um, no, I went to college. I went as far as college. And because I actually wanted to be a carpenter stroke joiner, I never was ever thought about ending up in catering um and at that time to become a carpenter joiner you needed apprenticeships and they were hard to come by and i left college and waiting for this apprenticeship nothing came along and ended up in a restaurant generally speaking probably by default what was the passion for the for the carpentry was that just because of good money or i was just really good at it you know at school even at college, I took it on. I was really good. I could actually, I was quite creative. I could actually make, design and make a lot of things. So I was very good with my hands. So you don't get the apprenticeship then and you end up in a restaurant. So I ended up in a restaurant uh, just by default, really, being sat at home, waiting for apprenticeships. Nothing came along. And then the local milkman decided, uh, on his Sunday rounds, because they used to, milk was delivered 
at home daily at that time. It wasn't a supermarket job. And um, what happened was uh, he asked my dad if, uh, if why I'm sat at home and not doing anything. Um, and if I was interested in a job at his brother's restaurant. Right. Uh, and that's how and my dad obviously said, yes, of course he is. Take him now. <laughs> Straight in there. <laughs> yeah. What was the pay like then? Our pay was fantastic. I think it was uh, about £35 a week. £35 a week? Yeah. So, so they didn't do it per hour or per no, day? No, it was <laughs> £35 a week. Um, oh. Which was a... Which I, I can't... I, because I had nothing to compare um, with before that, so I couldn't say it was good or bad. But on my second job, when I went for my second job, I realised that the first one was pretty <laughs> bad. <laughs> yeah. So you go into restauranting. Is that where you learn that and get a passion for the industry or...? Um, Briefly, the first one was a bit of a nightmarish, horrible experience. It wasn't what we'd call a restaurant nowadays. It was more of a um, uh, kind of late night curry house uh, in a pretty racist type of town called Keithley, just up the road. Um, was that racist back then? It was then, back then, yes, 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 pretty. And um, we're talking here, what are we talking, 80 sort of seven, eighty-eight, something like this. Okay. Um, and, um, but the customers only came after the pubs, so they're half drunk and fighting and quarreling and, you know, it, was a, it wasn't a nice experience. So, um, and I got fired uh, because apparently the owner felt that I wasn't picking the job up as fast as I should have done. He'd... Uh, he felt that he'd spent about six weeks, I think it was about six weeks, um, and I wasn't getting anywhere. Um, as a waiter or is it... As, as a waiter, okay. yeah, as a waiter. And I remember his words quite quite clearly till this day. And I really have to thank him because I'm one of those people, I, I really love challenges. And I work best under pressure and, uh, you know, uh, uh, as I'm challenged. So, and um, I, I think he was being polite. I think he was being polite, and he says, listen, Shabir, he says, you know, you, you're a very capable guy. I'm sure you can do anything you want. You'll be good at whatever you do, but I don't think this is for you. He says, okay. And, uh, and he says, thank you very much. So I went home. I didn't tell my parents because it was a bit of embarrassment, and uh, how am I going to explain to my father that I've actually been fired from what he called, he didn't even consider working in a restaurant a real job. To him, a real job was working in the textile, doing 12 hours a day, foundry work, tough, hard labour. That to him was work. And he never took a day off until he was 65 or 66 when he got his pension. He never took a day off, worked all the way through. You know, he was, he was an ex-sort of army man. Wow. And so he was very disciplined, tough guy. Uh, so for his son to kind of come home and tell him that, listen, I've been fired from this restaurant job. I just couldn't face it. So same day, at four o'clock, instead of going to work in Keefley, I'd set off in my uniform and I'd started going around in Bradford, sort of canvassing myself a job. Right. And uh, I kind of met a friend who recommended me somewhere and I ended up in my second job. And it, that second job, which um, was for a restaurant, the restaurant was called Shakes, as in not Shakes as in milkshake, but Shakes as in Middle Eastern Middle, Shakes. Yeah. Um, it was a big sort of chapel converted into a restaurant. It's still there in the middle of, it's in Westgate. Okay. Um, and that, to me, was where I fell in love with the job. That was the place. That, to me, was the environment where I wanted to be working. And since then, I never looked back. You mentioned your dad was a military man. He was quite strict. W would you say that had an effect on you now and that's influenced the man that you've become? Yeah, 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 of course. And, 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 that, and at that time, I didn't appreciate it a lot, but, but I must really look back and thank him for it because he was very strict. We had to be home by 7 p.m., uh, whether it's summer or winter. So we used to look at other kids playing in the street and out till nine, ten o'clock. No, not you lot. You sit at home. Seven o'clock. You're not doing anything. You're not going nowhere. You're not going out. You're not doing nothing. <laughs> this is not fair. This is not right. But you know what? 
I thank him for it wholeheartedly today because that, that discipline and that keeping us away from the streets has made us as a family, me, what we are today. Parents right now that are looking and listening, what kind of advice would you give to them? I really feel sorry for parents today. I really, really feel sorry for parents. And one of the reasons why this country or the, or, or the youngsters of this generation are so out of control and so <sighs> there's so much trouble look when we were growing up if the policeman decided to give us a clout on the back of the ear he was allowed so we were scared of the police if my father wanted to give me a clout on the back of the other ear he was allowed we were scared of him if the neighbours came and complained about us we'd get another clout <laughs> and we were scared of the neighbours if the Mulbi Saab wanted to give us a clout, he could do too. Yeah. So we were scared of him too. So we never had the kind of problems what parents and the society is facing now. That's true. We didn't have groups of 40, 50, 100 of us turning up with machetes and baseball bats and battering the hell out of each other in broad daylight. So... I think I really feel for the parents of this era. And they've got a tough job. Their hands are tied. Their mouths are tied. If the parent said anything, call the social workers. If the teacher said something, call the social workers. I think the whole system's gone wrong. So I what would your advice be then? How, how do you fix the system? Unfortunately, we're living in a society we cannot fix. Because our voice is not, not going to be heard. We're against the, we're, you're working against the masses. You can't say anything. You can't do anything. You can't make certain derogatory comments, which we grew up with and never blinked an eyelid. So I suppose it is really a tough time for being a parent. I think these days, uh, the kids are definitely not scared of their parents at all. It's almost all the way around. I see sometimes parents are scared of their children, yes. which is bizarre. So you go into your first job, uh, you then get sacked from that, you find your second role at Sheikh's, you're now working there. What kind of uh, experience are you like having there? You mentioned in your first role you experienced a lot of racism in Keefley. Yeah. Was it the same racism around that time or? No, this was a really high class, um, high class uh, Pakistani restaurant, really upmarket. I think the guy, even at that time in, 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 in that sort of, what are we talking mid 80s and I, I started that bit later I think it was 87, 88 or something or maybe 89 um, at that time I'm sure he spent something maybe around half a million quid which wow. is a lot of money yeah back then that time, a lot of money and, and he attracted all the top clients uh, and they were nice people they were people that you wanted to serve people who appreciated being served people who came there um, to have an enjoyable evening not just a late night curry to fill the belly. Um, so it was fantastic. There was maybe 50, 60 staff working. You felt part of a team. You know, you had other people that you looked at and inspired by and thinking, wow, they're so good, whether it was a chef, whether it was a waiter. And, you know, it was just, it was just a great, to me, it was like, it was like walking from Keefley to this place in Bradford. It was like, leaving a village and going into a massive big city. That's how much difference I was. And were you working as a waiter there as well? I was working as a waiter. And, and, and that's where I saw myself. And, and that's where I fell in love with the job. So then how do you go from a waiter to an entrepreneur then? There was no question and there was no thought of being an entrepreneur. All my vision was, there was a, there was a guy called Salim. I think Salim went on to work with... Uh, Mumtaz for many years. He was exceptional. He was brilliant. This guy, I my only goal was I want to be as good as him. Um, you just knew him from the area, or no, no, no. I just met him on the job. Okay. And um, and there used to be sixteen waiters working there, and the restaurant was kind of split in halves. And the two managers on a Friday, Saturday night, they'd pick the teams, who'd have which ones, and either. It, and, and the first or second choice was either me or Salim. Most of the time, he was first choice. And my only goal was, I need to be number one. 
some very competitive. Eventually that did happen. He was exceptional. He was, uh, that's what my vision was. I need to be as good or better than Salim. Salim was a fantastic guy. He still is. And I think he did many years of service at Mumtaz. Um, I was a very, very good guy. That's all I wanted to be. Was he a waiter as well? or was He, he was a waiter as well, okay, yeah. Okay, so two he waiters. He was a waiter. He was a waiter. He was fantastic. He was... Um, uh, and the shocking thing was, after um, about nine months, when I just about to reach, and I could sort of... You know, it was me and him were number one and number two. Um, one day I went to work and he's in the kitchen. He's cooking. And that was a bit of a sort of mini heart attack for me. How, wh why is he cooking? How are you cooking? When did you learn to cook? Because I could cook before I did the waitering. I just gave up. <laughs> I just gave up. Yeah. I thought, this guy's beyond. But no, mashallah. Um, you know, it's, I always set myself small goals. Small goals. So from being sort of a head waiter, I wanted to be a manager. Uh, I got my first manager's job um, when the Nawab restaurant opened in Bradford. So I was actually the first manager there. Um, so that was a big achievement for me. Um, I think I was only probably going to be laughing at this. I think 21. Wow, and you were a manager by 21. Yeah, so the first Nawab in Bradford, yeah, I was the manager at 21. So you can imagine all the teams older and, and, and sort of maturer than me. But yeah, I was the manager at 21 at Nawab. Is that just because of your experience and that's what you were doing? Yeah that's, yeah, that's right. It was my experience and my love and ambition for the job to be sort of the best at whatever bit I do whether it was a waiter, whether it was a head waiter, whether it was a manager. And then later on, as a chef as well, I just wanted to be uh, the best that I possibly can. And where do you think this trait of wanting to be the best comes from? I think it's something that you either have or you don't. It's not something that you, you can turn yourself into. You either have that drive or you don't. Uh, it's, it's a very funny, I, I think it's in within your DNA. I see certain people, and I was listening to your podcast from the last couple of weeks ago with, uh, uh, by Aslam from Agra. Yeah. And he mentioned that he's got certain people that have been there from him, with him since day one for 40 odd years that are still washing dishes. Yeah. Because their tunnel vision or, 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 or their little world doesn't exceed whatever they are. And some people kind of see over and beyond that and it's that drive i think you have to be born with that drive and that can come but it depends on how much you want whatever you want to achieve you've got to have a goal and you've got to think well hang on I, am i enjoying this yes can i do better yes how then think how can i better this are you going to follow somebody who's better than you are you going to learn? Are you going to go back to education? How are you going to better than this? And that's how you exceed. It's the action after the idea. Also, you have to give yourself a timeline. If you don't have a timeline, you'll never execute anything. Because, as we all know, tomorrow never comes. Yeah. So never leave anything to tomorrow. Leave it to Friday. That might be five days after tomorrow. But at least you know that's your deadline. So execution on a timeline that's the key well, if there's listeners listening right now that may be lazy waiting for an opportunity to come to them what kind of advice could you give to those kind of people would you say they can actually succeed or i think anybody can exceed uh, sorry succeed at whatever they want but it just depends on how badly you want it also now we all want things badly you know we want this we want that but it's what kind of knowledge and what kind of experience do you have and what kind of USPs, um, what you're going to bring. Well, let's take a milkshake, for example. Somebody wants to open a new milkshake um, takeaway in the city. Fantastic, yes, good idea. But then and somebody else will look at it and think, why? There's so many milkshake shops in the town, why are you going to do another one? But if you can provide five unique selling points for that milkshake, you will succeed. Five unique selling points for any business is the key to success. And how do you find those unique selling points? Is this is where you have to invest your time. Like I said, either go back to education, either find somebody who's better than you, or create something that other people are not doing, 
or present things in the way other people are not presenting, you've got to find them five unique selling points. So people that want to just copy ideas or, you know, like a one, one business starts and then another 10 follow, you'd say that's a lot more difficult. Yes. Now, let's take Bradford, for example. And I'm, I'm going to keep going back to restaurants because that's the field I yeah. understand. Or let's take, for example, Durrani's, for example. Yeah. We have jewelers and jewelers and jewelers and jewelers and jewelers that have been here decade after decade after decade. But when we opened this shop in a space of 12 months, the whole city knew that we'd opened a shop. The whole city within less than 12 months. For example, if I ask you, which part of Bradford do you live in? Uh, BD2. BD2. So once it's open, how long was it after before you knew that? Straight, yeah, Leeds Road, straight away. There you go. That's what it is. Either you're going to have to. So I gave it 12 months, but I think the whole of Bradford knew way before 12 months there's a new shop open. And so that's my point. Create. Invest time. Go out. Go out to other cities, other countries. Me and Hava did that. Get inspirations. Get ideas. You have to have inspirations. And when you find those ideas, don't be scared and think, no, we can't do that. It's so hard. It's doable. Do you think having the finances now, obviously some people might be listening and saying you're able to buy these prime spots on Leeds Road. It plays an advantage to yourself. So for people that don't have the funds to be able to invest in a, in a sort of location like this and maybe they're in the back streets or whatever, do you feel like that plays a part in it as well? Or? Sure. Let me uh, answer that one's a very good point and you're right. Then let's take, for example, there's a place at the bottom of Leeds Road, and I don't know if you're familiar with it, have you heard of it? Is it called, is it called Burgerism or Burgerize? Oh, yeah, yeah, familiar with sell smash burgers. Let's take that as a perfect example. Them boys studied for a product, that was burgers, got a location which you will never find unless you had the postcode. We agree? Yeah, of course. You, and when you turn up on site, you won't even know it's there. And a little door opens, and you collect your burger. Looks like and we all go. Yeah. We don't know what's inside. It might be the state of the art kitchen. It might be the most basic setup. But what they did was they invested in their product. And it's a good product. So not necessarily you have to be in prime location to get that. Okay, yes, I'm privileged. And we were privileged to be able to do this. But if the product is right, because remember, whether it's gold, Curry, burger, it's the product that's going to sell. The surroundings help, but it's the product. That's, that's powerful advice. So let's take it back to you starting the business now. So your manager at Nawab, how does your career progress from there? From Nawab, um, I think I spent uh, just close to under a year working at Nawab. And I became a bit big-headed because... I helped to turn that business around. It was uh, in a very difficult uh, financial situation when I started with them. Um, and I turned it around. Uh, so I became a bit big-headed. Some chappy came from Leeds, just walked in and he says, listen, I've heard about you. I want you, I'm opening a new restaurant. And, and I have to say, I wasn't really entirely too happy. So I gave him a figure which I thought, hoped that he'd run off. So I gave him a figure, which was just under 500 quid at that time. We're talking late um, 89, something like this. Is yeah? that like a week, a month? Or a week. A week. 480 quid, I said to him. He said, yes. And I said, pardon? He goes, yes. His response got my attention. And that worked kind of, it was a decision because my heart wasn't in it and I went for the money. Um, the place didn't work out. So I'd left this great place where I was, and, and I did enjoy working at the Wab. And uh, went to Leeds, this place didn't work out. I felt a bit sort of embarrassed coming back. So I thought, nope, not going back to Bradford. 
It's a bit of a bestie. Because all the lads, everybody knew each other. You know, it was a case of like, okay, you've gone, you've had your prata now, you've come back, huh? You're not that good after all, are yeah. you? You know, it's like when you're on a roll, you're on a roll and you think you're untouchable. And so this kind of, I kind of took this a bit personal. So I thought, nope, I'm not going backwards. Let's go to London. So I looked and there was a place in called Carnes in uh, Bayswater, central London. And I'd heard about this place because there was a guy that came from there once and he worked with us at Shakes. And apparently this place had about 90 staff and it had queues on seven days a week. And you know, let me go and try this. I went there, thinking I'm very good. I'll do well here. It was a new world. It was, it was just something else was that place. Um, I've never seen a more busier place than what that was till this day. It was like a factory. It was like a production line. It was, I, I, I wouldn't even like to guess even till this day how many customers they served today. Uh, but it was very educational because the system was good. I managed to pick up, and this is why I've been very successful at serving a lot of numbers in a short period of time. Um, so I worked there, worked at another couple of places in London, and so I came back even more qualified. So I turned that kind of bad experience into something good uh, and then came back to this city again. And just advice for listeners that maybe go through uh, bad times or go through the hardship that you were going through, how do you pull yourself out of the hardship and turn that negative situation positive? Persistence. You have to. You cannot. Look, um, persistence is very important. You have to. Because, look, life is not a bed of roses. You're going to have your ups and downs. Sometimes you do everything right, but something's not happening or what you're wanting doesn't happen. But it doesn't mean that it's wrong. It just probably, to me, that means it's not the right time. So, you know, persistence is important. At that stage, I could have given up and said, well, I want to try something else. I want to give up on the restaurants. You know yourself. And if you know yourself, in, if you believe in yourself, persistence is my, my, my answer to that. And not just that. You see, you have to, I'm quite fortunate, and, and I have to thank God. I can't thank God enough for how God has been kind to me in business and general family and everything, really. Um, but yes, people do go through difficulties. I'm not saying I've not had my fair share of trials and, 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 and issues. But I think if you stay focused, and, and at that time, is the most helpful thing is having a strong family network behind you. I have a brother uh, who's older than me, but who's been a real backbone. Um, I have very good family very supporting family um, and and team that I worked with. I never, because I've been a worker myself, I never worked with my team as a boss. I worked with them as one of them. So even when I'm having difficult times or if I was having struggling, my team carried on. And that's been my greatest sort of grace of all. You mentioned there that you've got a strong family unit. Are your family involved in your business? Yeah, I mean, considering the number of staff that we have, yeah. uh, the family members are very small. There must not be more than uh, 10 of us. So, so, so family is very important because family support, uh, they understand you know, um, you, that you have to work at awkward hours, you have to work under difficult conditions, and especially mm. with me venturing out to many different cities further away from Birmingham to Glasgow, um, spending a lot of time away from home uh, and knowing that the kids are looked after, knowing that uh, you've got nothing to worry about at home. That is what helps you to continue working hard. And just on that point, how would you say you balance? Because yeah, like you mentioned, we had uh, Mr. Aslam on before and he mentioned that looking back on his life, he kind of regrets not spending as much time with his family yeah. uh, and just focusing all on business. Like, What would you say your opinion is on that and where would you stand? <laughs> there, was, <laughs> there was one part of uh, uh, Bay Aslam's, um, in, his, in his podcast, which nearly kind of threw me off my chair when he says that he didn't have a day off for sometimes up to three years at a time. And I thought... <laughs> You know what? Hands off to that guy. It's yeah. just something else. Um, no, I'm not that as bad. I generally have one day off a week. 
Um, especially when, when the kids were young. When the kids were young, it was one day off a week. We'd go out, take them to the movies, take them for a drive, whatever, no problem. Um, but now three of them are married and kind of get on with their life. And I think they want to spend time with their husbands rather than the dad. Uh, yeah. Are they all daughters? All daughters. Sure. Uh, fourth one studying. Um, but so I kind of maybe work a bit more now, probably on the sixth and half day. Uh, but before it was always one day off and uh, kind of catch up with the family. So that's the day that you spent with your family yeah. and balance. Yeah. Yeah. And would you say that's important, having that work-life balance? Or I think it's very, very important because otherwise you're not in tune and you see your kids grow up uh, and, you don't, and you miss that and you will regret that. Because I was watching, I can't remember whose podcast it was. Um, somebody says that out of all the people that died, and that if, if an angel asked them, what do you regret the most? And none of them would answer, oh, I wanted to work more. Or I wanted more time to work. It would be more time to spend with the family. And that kind of stood by me. And, you know, it makes a lot of sense. Because if somebody says to you, what, would you re- what have you regretted? You would never say, listen, I wanted to work more. I wanted more hours at work. That would not be your regret in life. Yeah. Has it always been like that for you in the early days of starting your business? No, in the early days, um, see, my, my one day was off, but the other days I didn't have a starting time or a finishing time. Just long hours. It was just, it, it had to be done. And in the beginning, I was the first one in and the last one out. Um, as you grow and you employ more people and you delegate more responsibilities, and this is what I need to share with a lot of people, if any of you from the industry are uh, watching this podcast or listening. If you want to grow, you must delegate and you must allow um, that responsibility to people that are capable for it. And unless you delegate, you can't grow. You know, that old school thinking of being the ever controlling everything is not the way forward. And that's been my key success. Delegate to the right people and move on. You wouldn't say like you're a really controlling kind of, you've no. got to do everything. Or... I'll, for, I'll give you an example. Um, this shop here, one of our biggest investment, I probably came here five months ago. The last time you came here? Yeah. I'll wow. see my partner, Hover. We'll go for dinner, have food. Discuss what you should discuss, but I've not been here for five months. Um, I haven't visited Manchester restaurant for four months. I haven't visited Glasgow for a year and a half. I haven't been to Newcastle for actually that was about two weeks ago. <laughs> that was two weeks ago. Yeah. But I haven't been to Middlesbrough for five months. But I speak to them all, though. I speak to them. We're in contact. Only if I need to. We, I try to sort of, to me, um, trusting your people and delegating to them and make, put, putting our time and effort into the managers is more important. Uh, because otherwise, how many branches can you be physically at? No more than one. It becomes a lot more difficult. No, you can only be one. So I think we need to formally introduce where you actually started the Akbar's brand. So when did the Akbar's brand actually start then? Um, well, the restaurant. Yeah, the restaurant. The restaurant started across the road uh, in 1996. Well, it was late 95 November, I, but for me it's always 96 because it's kind of almost end of the year. <coughs> so 96, um, 28 seats, 12 tables, um, and uh, with a team of eight. Um, and it was pretty good because I had so much experience on customer service and on the food side. We was pretty lucky and, uh, and it was pretty successful from day one because it wasn't just like a new restaurant beginning, starting and 
you know, it wasn't learning. The people that I employed were people that I'd worked with in the past, so I knew what their strengths and weaknesses were. So it was kind of starting with the right team. And, uh, and it's been a good journey. Um, people always ask, uh, especially at the beginning, uh, how did you manage to get the finances from the context of being a waiter and a worker and then a manager? Did yeah. you just save funds or yeah. get investment? Or? Sure. When I went to my second job, and after spending se- uh, about a year there, and I decided that I wanted to have a restaurant of my own one day, I could see myself in it. My target was to save £100 a week over seven, eight years, that would have given me 35, 40 grand. And then there was some borrowing from my brother and my mom and a couple of relatives. And I had a partner. And then I took a partner on as well. A very nice gentleman who's been with me from day one. Fantastic guy. Um, still my partner. We still work together um, in all the Akbars. Um so it was a combination of saving, borrowing from family, and, and, and having a business partner. So I've got a f- couple of follow-ups from there. One is, what kind of investment does it take to start up a business like Akbar's in the 1990s? Um, at that time, small restaurant it was, 2,000 square foot, Yeah, uh, which is relatively about the same size of the shop. If you imagine this shop and then double it at the back. Yeah. So it's about that size. Um, at that time, it cost us, I think, about thirty thousand pounds. Thirty thousand pound. Yeah. Oh, is that doing it all up and then getting it all? Doing up it all up and it was very basic. Don't yeah. get me wrong. It was very basic. It was just sort of you know simple stuff. But uh, I was more relying on the product. The product was my kind of uh, strength area, followed up by the customer service, which was my also strength area as well. So that was my strength area, the product and the service. The product and the service. And uh, you just mentioned you were able to save £100 a week then. So just advice to our listeners. We've got a lot of young listeners, um, a lot of people that maybe spend money, finance cars. In this generation, it's it's quite easy to spend money and finance cars and get liabilities and, and live beyond your means. So what kind of advice could you give to our youngsters? I'm going to uh, I'm going to give them the same advice that Mr. Aslam did. And I loved what he said. It yeah. really... You know, I, I listen to people and there's things that I like. I always stick to me. Uh, and he said, I don't know if you can remember, uh, about money, uh, houses and cars. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he said, cars and houses can't buy you a good business. This is uh, from by Muhammad Aslam from Agra. This is not me saying it. Yeah, yeah? that was a powerful. And he's, it was a very powerful and it's going to stay with me for the rest of my life. So, cars and houses don't buy you good business. Good businesses can buy you the cars and houses. So I think that's the answer to that kind of, you know, I think that just sums it up. Yeah, no, it's a powerful, powerful message very powerful, out there. Very powerful, I'm very impressed. I, I, Mr. Aslam's always been my role model, um, although we never worked together. I wish I'd worked for him, Yeah. because I've worked for a few other guys in the city. We never had that opportunity, but I still admire him as, 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 as an iconic pioneer of this industry yeah i remember you saying that on a on a video that i watched uh on on the internet i think it was Khan's video i think i saw it initially um so what what is it that you admired about him then i admired that he, he changed the whole concept of curry houses into restaurants so he brought the curry houses because in the past it was all curry houses kashmir karachi sweet center uh I'm not talking about my Lahore, I'm talking there was another one called Lahore's yeah. and, you know, Belawans and all these places, uh, Sweet Palace, these were all curry houses. He introduced the concept of curry restaurant where people made an effort to come, where they'd book a table, where they'd eat at 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock in the evening, not half past 10, 11 after the pubs. And, and he... He turned it into that a cuisine rather than a quick curry. I just want to touch upon your thoughts on competitors. Then you know how you look up to Mr. Aslam. What's your thoughts around competition and competitors, and what's your sort of mindset around them? Yeah, I'm going to say something now. It might be a bit controversial, so I don't know how the competitor is going to take this. Yeah, but I, I but I'm a man. I always speak my heart, and I speak what what is in my heart. 
I do, you know, the other restaurant that was so iconic and, and it had a national brand, it was one unit in Bradford, but it was a national brand. And that was Mumtaz. You know, people in London and Scotland knew Mumtaz. And they used to travel from there just to eat at his place. To me, it saddens that it never went further afield. And, and I think if they'd, at the right time, moved, they would have been national now. Or at least they'd have been really big in cities like Leicester and Birmingham and, and uh, Glasgow, where yeah. there's a thick community of Asian people, Pakistani people, Indian people. Um, I wish they'd have done more because they were the one of the sort of another strong group that was growing strong and was very strong. And they put, Brad, they put Bradford on the map. Mumtaz. Yeah. They put Bradford on the map. Mr. Aslam turned the curry house into a restaurant and Mumtaz put Bradford on the map. There was no place in Birmingham that stood up, stood out. There was no place in Leicester. There was no place in Manchester that was a stronger brand as what Mumtaz of Bradford was. And why do you think they didn't just venture out? Now, this is my only yeah. thing, and I'm taking a shot in the dark. Only they can answer this question. And, 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 I, and, and I think it'd be nice. And I'd love to see Mr. Mumtaz on the podcast. Yeah, we'll get him um, on next, yeah. Um, and only he can give you the, 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 the insight. But I think they probably got busy with their factory and producing food. Um, you know, for the supermarkets and stuff. But that's my take and that's my shot in the dark. I don't know the reality. But I think they should have done, in my opinion, I think they'd have done a brilliant job. I think that would have been another great Bradford brand out in the country. So you don't see competitors as a threat? And you no. Know uh, shall, I, shall I be honest with you? One of my... The, in the industry, there's... I, I get on with well. I respect everybody. Everybody's yeah. got their own rizuk. I can't take off anybody. Nobody can take off me. We've got it. It's written. It's done. But you know my... Probably the best friend in the industry. The closest one. From Bradford as well, though? Yeah. It's Shaq from uh, Milo Hose. Wow. We sit. We talk. We discuss suppliers. We discuss everything. We discuss our pricing structures. We do everything. We work that close. It's really interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. from the outset, people always think that, you know, you might be competing, but behind closed doors, you guys are collaborating and yeah, working yeah, together. Yeah. No, no, no issue. No issue. No, 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 not at all. Because you have to understand, you, it's simple. What is in your kismet is your kismet. Your cry chicken is not going to be the same as mine. But that's the beauty of restaurant industry. Your recipe is yours, mine is mine. And the rest is... Kismet is whatever the consumer wants. So there's nothing we can do to take anything off each other. And I think that was old school mentality. And that it doesn't exist in this generation for us. It's a powerful mindset to have. So you start your Akbar's brand 1996 or 1995, was it? Yeah. Let's Around that time. <coughs> uh, how do you then progress that business in the early years? What kind of struggles did you face? Um, my first struggle came... When uh, I'd had about five shops here and the place was still very busy and I needed more. But by that time, the, the neighboring shops, because they knew that I could afford it and I needed it, were sort of spending, uh, asking ridiculous money. So I had no choice but to look for a site elsewhere. Right. Um, I found a place in Leeds, which is Eastgate. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. Which is Eastgate. Um, restaurant still there, still growing strong. And um, that was my kind of most scariest time, thinking, well, if I open another restaurant, what's going to happen to this one? Where can I be? How can I be at two places at once? I run this one um, in the old style, which was first guy in, last guy out dealt with every single customer myself. Um, how am I going to do that? How am I going to replicate? And uh, I had a, three assistant managers that worked under me here. 
One was uh, Mohammed Bashir, also known as Paul. Um, and I asked him, I says, if I open Leeds, would you go? He says, yes. I says, uh, I says, can you handle it? He says, yes. So we spent good three, four months, him shadowing me very closely, no problem. For a few months before we opened, I would let him make all decisions in here, so he, in this restaurant, so that he, under, so I wanted to sort of test whether his decision making was right, perfect. So the day before we opened, we always open on a, a grand opening Thursday, first day of business is Friday. And uh, Thursday when he, we said goodbye to him, it's grand opening, I said, I'm not coming in tomorrow, tomorrow's your first day of business. I says, uh, Paul, I'm working in Bradford at the weekend, don't disturb me. I've taught you everything that I can teach you now. It's up to you. So if you call me, and if I have to leave my place to come here, he says, you, you're going home. Saturday, 8 o'clock, he calls me. He says, you need to get here. So I'm fuming, I'm thinking. I took Asif with me, who was then later went on to be the uh, general manager at Manchester. I said, Asif, come on, you're taking over throwing this guy out. Went to Leeds, parked up on the on Hedgerow. And I could see the queue about 50 metres down the road, outside, on the pavement. We walked in. I seen Paul, pretty relaxed, calm, thinking, you called the SOS and you, he's so calm. <laughs> I says, you called? But now I've calmed down a bit as so I'm thinking maybe this is too much for him. I said, what's the problem? He says, no problem. He says, you've seen it outside? <laughs> I says, yeah. He says, you can go now. No way. Honestly. Wow. I says, it's okay now, you can go. He says, okay. So me and Asif turned around, went back. So you're just showing you how successful it was? Yeah, he was showing me. He says, your place in Bradford is really busy. He goes, we've done big numbers here. He goes, but we, you've never had queue outside in Leeds. It's fair enough. Came back. Okay. And, and that's what gave me the encouragement to continue going further into other cities and keep going and going and going. I realized that if I spend enough time and quality time training my guys, we can create many Pauls and many Asifs. And that's what I went on to do. I think that's what I'm going to try and figure out is how you turned Akbar's into a brand. And, and that's what a lot of business owners, when we said we're going to get you on, always want to know. The question is, how do you go from a business to a brand? Because there's a difference. Akbar's is now a brand. It is. But obviously, it's going to be a brand because of a... Hum basically, anything that has a demand is a brand. Anything that has a demand. It just meant how much demand you're going to create for your product. You see... If you went to Harrods and you bought, a friend of mine, he owns a company called uh, Fragrance Dubois. He's actually a lad from Sheffield. Okay. But it's on the sixth floor of Harrods. He's inside Harrods. It's on the sixth floor. That's where the exclusive stuff is. And they probably don't sell more than three bottles a week, but they're a brand. So you don't have to sell millions of items. It is who you sell it to, what you're selling. So it's all about demand. If your product has got the demand, you're a brand. You need to create the demand for the product. And that's you could have a massive showroom of anything. But if you haven't got the sales, you haven't got the customers, you haven't got people telling you, it's not a brand. And how do you then create the demand? So for yourself, you said you, you've got the attention to detail to perfecting the product. So being a chef, I knew that the food wasn't a problem. We had a central production unit, which did all the stocks and the sauces and the marinades and so on. And what I learned at, at the Leeds branch and with Paul was that it is actually possible to create somebody or train somebody that can be as good as you. 
But what? But then there's one thing that will always lack in them. The hunger and the drive. So how do you put hunger and drive into somebody? Well, I found the formula for that. Okay, that's interesting. So you're giving them the experience, but they're not as hungry. So you give them a share of that business. You allow them to invest a bit of their own money. Then no longer are they workers. They are no longer managers. They are mini owners. And believe you me, when they have got a financial stake, they will be the first in and the last out. And every penny and every bit of stock and everything will matter to them. I allow them, a very good manager, to invest anything from 10 to up to 25% in each of the restaurants. Is it just so managers or is it employees in general? Mostly it's managers. Mostly managers. Mostly managers. Uh, in some of them, there's a chef as well. So, so a chef will have 12.5% and the manager will have 12.5%. Right. So it's both chefs and managers. Um, but mostly managers. And, and, and believe you me, for that, their hunger is more than yours. They've still got to buy their big house. They've still got to get their car. They've still got to sort of, you know, go out and sort of live the life. So they're more hungry and more enthusiastic than, than what even you are. Because your hunger's gone. So you might be a bit lazy now. You've become a bit lazy. You've become a bit complacent. But they're not. They're still going strong. I was in uh, Vanilla Rooms and uh, probably a few months ago and I was speaking to Afshan, the manager there, and he was saying something similar. I think he was talking about, I want to get shares in, in the restaurant one yeah. day. And, and it gives people, it gives people like Afshan and other ones coming up incentive. And yeah. they look at this company and they say, you know what? If I go work somewhere else, I'm going to be working all my life. Work here, work hard, and I might get something to show for it at the end. Yeah, I'll become part of the company, and you know, as in part of uh, uh, as as a, as a shareholder, and and them small percentage of shareholdings have changed their lives. You've got some skin in the game, then, haven't you? So yeah, it makes sense. No, when he was talking about, it, he was excited. You could tell. So it definitely works. So for you to scale out then you you sometimes sell a percentage of the business to the uh, the managers yeah and that's helped Who, you scale up as well that's right so the managers then do the day-to-day -day running yeah they run it on a day-to-day -day basis any issues they'll come and talk to us we have a, a very strong office team that does the marketing does the account do the legals uh, they'll take care of all that deal with all the training the first aids the 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 um, every kind of training, everything that they need will provide that. Uh, and the manager just runs it and operates it. I have uh, three, four internal auditors that actually go around every day, visit three restaurants, start from outside in the bin areas to the kitchen, to the stock rooms, waiters, uniforms, customer service, all that. So we kind of follow way up through. And um, um, so that works better for us. And that's why I've been able to grow. So. It's like having a mini me in each place. Yeah, so it's the people that make the business. It is the people that make the business, yeah. yeah. So for yourself then, you, you've built, you've gone through the 2000s. Did you uh, have any difficulties in the sort of recession 2008? Well, because Akbar's has never been a luxury product yeah. where you'd have to save or, you know, it's never been silly money. To, to eat at Akbar's. So, so rece recessions don't work for us. Recessions hit hard only at the top tier. So anybody whose product is at top tier, the most expensive, recession hits them. If you're affordable, you'll always survive. You'll always survive because you are affordable. And what makes Akbar's stand out from the rest? And what's the unique selling point? You talked about USPs earlier. What's the USPs for uh, Akbar's? Um, basically, it's A, value for money. B, quality product. C, good-looking restaurants. D, good service. And E, E is consistency. It's always the same. It doesn't fluctuate from here. One day you're having a fantastic right course, the next day you're having average. It's consistent. And our central production unit controls that. And we're always changing and chopping. And, you know, uh, I, I don't sit idle. Um, even through COVID, I got bored. Uh, I said to the guys, let's shut the restaurants down, let's take six months off. 
And some of them did a few months, but then everybody's got their own overheads and stuff. And some of them said, no, we want to carry on. Let us run it as a takeaway. It was okay. So <coughs> some of the restaurants, the managers took off time. I was one of those, took it off. Went to Pakistan, could stay here. Um, and I spent a lot of time in Peshawar, uh, tasting, trialing, cooking, learning. A lot of these chersi, shanwari, these types of dishes. Brought something back and started a new craze in Bradford. So now, yeah. since I started the chersi cry, I think there's about four places. They're opening do, up, yeah. yeah. they're opening. And now you're going to see them popping everywhere. I've seen the, the king of curry. So what makes you the king of curry? If I was to answer that myself, one, it is the sheer volume of curry that we serve, first of all. So, in 12 restaurants, I think we must have served millions of curries. Number two, there are certain things that I've created, that I've introduced into this curry business, which no man has done before me. So let's start. First of all, I'm the guy who invented the naan tree. Yeah. My biggest regret, I should have patented it. <laughs> it is actually now used everywhere by everybody. But I invented that. I went to my metal worker. Yeah. He's still in Bradford. It's called Shab from Design Catering. I said, Shab, I'm opening a restaurant. And Bradford, at that time, they used to do naans just big. And, and before I opened that place, and I'd been to Birmingham once, oh, where the nuns were big. And I'm thinking, I've got a small restaurant. If I make that big nan, I need to make my table bigger. And I can't afford to lose tables. So I says to him, we, I've drawn this thing. I've got a nan, I need to hang it on something. <laughs> so me and Shab, he's actually called Shabir as well. Together, I gave him the idea. I says, can you make me this? Do a heavy base so it doesn't fall over. Bring it upwards. And in the beginning, there was only hooks on one side. Now we put hooks on both sides yeah. so you can put two nans on. Hooks on one side, I said, so I can hang it and, and, and make it vertical. So it's really, it was like a space saver. I didn't know it was going to turn into a craze. People started coming to the restaurant just to see that. Just for the snack, yeah. yeah. Snack. So I invented that. And... The second thing that I introduced, and I'm not going to say I invented, but I introduced into this trade, people have been eating gulab jamuns for many years, way before me. I did not create the gulab jamun, nor do I claim. But I created warm gulab jamun with ice cream. That's me. Nobody can challenge that anywhere. I introduced that. Now people are eating at weddings, serving it on the restaurants. That's mine. And how did you come up with that idea? I used to go to a nice restaurant in uh, Leeds. Uh, it was This was going back... Um, 98, 99. And they used to serve this like a warm, spongy... Um, like a sponge cake, warm, but with ice cream. It was like a gulab, gulab, gulab jamun, but it was like a warm sponge cake, like a treacly one. I thought, hang on, we can do that. We don't want to do that one because we wanted to keep it a bit authentic. So I started warming up the gulab jamun, serve it with ice cream, and next minute, it's on everybody's menu now. Okay? Yeah. Number three. Um, I started, we do this chutney. It's called like a, we call it Asian chutney, but it's this one with the pudna, marcha, and and uh, green chilies and lemon it's the green one that you have in akbar's pickle tree yeah uh which was very realistic and it's very close to what we eat at home i brought that to the industry uh i invented and created the chicken nambali nobody has ever done that before uh people call it other names now and serve the same thing these are people that have probably worked for me and sort of do the same recipe. That's my creation. Offering shares to my employees. Yeah. Unknown in our industry. No Asian 
from the 80s and 90s would consider that, hey, outsider, give me a share, you're mad. I introduced that. And next one, I grew up in this industry, whether I was working at Sheikh's or in Sanamin Tengi, uh, Keefley. And for many years, I think Agra did the same as well. That the, the music they used to play, they only knew one kind of music. And it was that all Ravi Shankar, Tabla, Stroke, the Sitar, and some of the Bengali restaurants still doing it till this day. And that very horrible music, <laughs> it was so bad. The day I opened my restaurant, I changed that concept. And I wanted to never play that music. I used to have nightmares about it in my dreams. Uh, changing the music, creating a very vibrant atmosphere. Making the dining a bit more casual. Not pretending to be fine dining when we're a curry. But let's be casual. Um, so there was many factors that I actually single-handedly changed in this industry. So that's one of them. But besides that, I think the key one that you want to know is because I've, been, I've won that eight times from multiple different organizations up and down the country as the king of curry. You use it now for marketing as well, obviously seen on roundabouts, King of Curry, Akbar's. Yeah. Yes, it is. And and I'm thinking, well, it is what it, we are and, and, and I feel confident in that because, you know, sometimes you have an individual restaurant and they call themselves King of Curry and I'm thinking, how do you manage that? You're not known out of this city. You're not known from for 60 miles away from here. People don't know who you are. How can you claim that such a title? But it is what it is. Yeah, so you'd say you have the best restaurant in uh, in the UK, would you say? Or uh, I say people have one good restaurant and they are very happy. Yeah, I say I have a dozen. So I should be 10 times more happier. <laughs> <laughs> so me going past Leeds Road, I've seen that Cafe Akbar has, has closed. People always asking, why is it closed? Uh, so are you going to give us an exclusive and give us the answer? So the Cafe Akbar uh, never closed. All it did was, it was the Cafe Akbar needed a renovation, so did the restaurant. And we wanted to take the alcohol out of the restaurant, which we did. Um, and then, because here we own all the car park, and over there we were renting the car park, and there's always issues with the neighbours, uh, parking cars and so forth, we decided to close the restaurant, so, that, so, so the Akbar's restaurant, the licensed one, was closed, finished, gone, and the Akbar cafe moved in its place. So the restaurant's closed, not the cafe. The restaurant's closed. So the cafe is now, the full cafe menu is here available at the restaurant. Wow, that's interesting. So what made you close the restaurant? Because wasn't the restaurant more successful than the cafe? Or? It was, but I wanted to get rid of the alcohol from it. So I knew that once we get rid of the alcohol, we're going to uh, lose all the uh, English clientele which we knew that, that we, it was something that we'd forecasted. So we thought by moving the cafe here, and even though the restaurant had its <clears> own <throat> number of uh, Muslim customers, um, the two together would be enough to keep the restaurant busy. And it is really busy. It's probably busier than what it was before. Um, so no, the cafe is in full swing here. It's interesting. And the reason for stopping selling alcohol in there? Um, it was a personal thing. And, and it's something that I've been thinking about for a while. Yeah. So, um, and it's something that we've got plans for in the future to continue. Yeah, yeah brilliant. So you move Cafe Akbar's into your main restaurant. Uh, Vanilla Rooms is a separate a name. Not many people know, but Vanilla Rooms is also owned by Akbar's. Correct. Vanilla Room is uh, also mine. And, uh, but it, that has a slightly different menu. It targets a different kind of audience. That's more for younger uh, people, younger diners who probably don't want so much roti and, 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 and curry and uh, want more steaks and burgers and lasagnas and pastas and, and sizzlers and that kind of stuff. Yes. And along with obviously big choice of desserts. My go-to is vanilla rooms. I like the lamb chops. Yeah, you know the big sizzler you do, 15 yeah, yeah, round yeah. lamb chops with the mash, veg, every pasta, everything. That's right. So, so, so that's the kind of your probably age group. Yeah. Whereas the more sort of my age group would probably come here for the Chelsea cry with the nuns and stuff so 
you've kind of cornered Leeds Road because you had the top uh, cafe, then you had the restaurant, then you had the vanilla room. So people always used to say, what's the reasoning behind having three on one road? Like, is that a strategic decision or? No, it was more of a personal challenge, really. When you do one, you do two, and then you think, okay, can I do a third one here? And it was fine, it was good, it was brilliant. But now because I've got this kind of notion of non-alcohol here, um, we've gone back to two. So, but it was good. And, and it, it was a statement and, and a challenge to myself to make three restaurants on the same road, all three being the busiest of the three on Leeds Road, uh, taking the number one, two and three spot, third spot. For me, that was a, a personal achievement. So I suppose that answers the King of Curry, really. That is the King of Curry and the King of Leeds Road. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you think you've got both titles there. You uh, you build all these restaurants. You're really successful, mashallah. I just <coughs> want to ask you uh, just a couple of questions regarding uh, building a business and becoming successful for our listeners. We've got a lot of young listeners that are trying to start a businesses. So what kind of uh, attributes and personality traits do you need to achieve success? You're obviously humble. You've come from humble background. You're now at the level that you're at. So... People feel like they can relate to you a lot more than somebody that's maybe inherited the wealth. Yeah. Um, you need to have a clear idea of what you want to do. You want to spend enough time studying what you want to sell, whatever that is. You need to take time out and visit other successful businesses in the same field and ask yourself, how can you and or can you possibly do better? Um, and you have to have the determination to keep going. But as much, it's about spending time and doing the research in your product. <clears throat> because everything's going to be about your product. Look, the best story in Bradford, in my opinion, is a burger place called Fat Boys. Lovely family, great people. Um, so these boys started making burgers at home and selling them from across the road. Their product is what's got them now. I think they've got about two or three units now. They've, they're expanding, yeah, they're opening up everywhere. Yeah, that's right. From where? From mum's kitchen or home kitchen. Same thing, isn't yeah. it? What a success story. What a brilliant story. And now they're competing with the major burger uh, guys in the city. Out of nothing, out of nowhere. Um, why? Because only again and again, and I repeat myself, it's the product. Their burger was good. Or they could have opened a fancy shop, spent £200,000, and if the burger's not good or the product's not good, it means nothing. So you focus on the product. Product. Product is the key. Whether it's your perfume, your suit, is the product. That's what will bring people back to you. Um, of course, everything else goes with it. So theirs was the perfect success story, in my opinion, of Bradford. And you're just talking about Bradford there. We have to bring it in. We're big pioneers. We're trying to push Bradford entrepreneurs and, and the success stories from Bradford. You always get stigma. People always have a perception of Bradford. You're one probably one of the most successful, I'd say, uh, entrepreneurs to come out of Bradford. So it's a privilege to be here with you right now. But what's your thoughts on Bradford and the perception that it has? I think Bradford is a really fantastic place. It really is a really good, fantastic place. And I'll tell you, I spent time in Manchester, Birmingham, Newcastle, Glasgow, whatever I've got restaurants. And I know a lot of people, local people, and and, and, and my sort of social network is big, is huge. But I'll tell you one thing. Bradford is a really friendly place. And people out there are thinking, oh, really? No, Bradford is probably the most friendly place. Um, other cities, not naming any, are worse than Bradford. Bradford has got this kind of really good system where if anybody's got any issue with somebody, if there's two different groups, there'll always be a third party that will sit and resolve that issue. And nothing will ever come of it. This is generally Bradford. Bradford, will they'll always come to terms and talk things over and finish it. 
Whereas other cities, it's terrible. They will turn up in groups of hundreds with machetes and start chopping each other up in broad daylight. That doesn't happen in Bradford. That's not Bradford. Bradford is a very nice place. It's a very friendly place. Bradford is one of those. You keep yourself to yourself. Nobody's got any issue. Nobody hustles anybody. Nobody harasses anybody. Um, so I love Bradford. I would never change it for anywhere. And have you always grown up in Bradford? Always grown up in Bradford. I've worked in other cities. I've stayed in other cities. I have a lot of good friends in other cities. But I would always live in Bradford. I think that's what we're trying to push because there's a perception that Bradford's dangerous or... It's know. not dangerous at all. Bradford, nobody will say anything to anybody. If you don't say anything to anybody, nobody will say anything to you. Bradford is not like that. Other cities, we can't say the same for them. Yeah. You're right. The the top guys like yourself and all the, all the rest of them, they all have power over you know being able to resolve situations and help things from uh, escalating so yeah, yeah you feel safer here definitely We're now sat in Durrani's Durrani's is jewelry shop we spoke about it briefly earlier and you mentioned that this the reason you invested into this one of them was your daughter yeah because I have four daughters and and I can't see them running the restaurants after me really um, so I wanted to my partner here at the jewelry shop who's a fantastic jeweller, um, had a smaller shop on Tonner Lane. He wanted to expand, he wanted to move bigger. This place was available and, um, and we decided to sort of work together because I wanted to also leave something, some kind of business which the girls can manage and it's suitable for them, uh, an environment for them to work in. So my middle daughter, sorry, second daughter, she... Uh, is here full time. So so it was a nice business for us to diverse. It's nice, it's clean, you meet nice people, uh, and, 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 and so it's just kind of ticks all those boxes. Um, so it's quite possible that this is the way probably forward for the girls. So really, I think, uh, although I set this business up for my uh, daughter, because it's kind of an environment which is easy for them to work at, and I believe uh, it's different to the restaurant, and I've given Samara and uh, her sisters, I said, look, the challenge is, if you guys work hard, maybe this is the way forward. Maybe for the next generation, maybe it's a, uh, it's a chain of Durrani shops. You're capable. Um, I don't see there's any difference between having sons or daughters. So long as they're able and they have the drive, they can take businesses even probably further than whatever I end up at. So my challenge to my girls is you need to exceed wherever I've taken the family business to, whether it's through jewellery or through the restaurant, but you guys have to exceed wherever, wherever I leave it. Mashallah, and uh, yeah, on online there's obviously stereotypes and people try and push this message that women shouldn't be in business. Uh, your thoughts on that is you, you push your daughters to go into business? Of course, and I would, I, I would, I would um, sort of recommend to anybody that the girls are probably, and this is whether they work for you or whether they run your business as your daughters or your partners, whatever, um, they're probably more committed to the job. And this is a national statistic. Women stay in a job longer than any man stays in a job. When a woman is in a job and she's comfortable, she'll spend years there, whereas men are always looking for more opportunities, trying to move on, trying to find better. So, no, women are probably more committed and probably do a better job. Um, so, no, I think if there's a stigma that women can't run businesses, I would have to totally disagree with that. It's a powerful message to put out to our listeners uh, to sort of empower all the women uh, that are out there trying to start businesses and uh, succeed. So that's a good message for all that. I suppose we need to look around us and see how many powerful women are out there and how many women have become so successful in business. And, 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 and the list is endless. Yeah. We just, we as Pakistanis, we need to change that mentality. And we need to sort of say, look, come on, guys. This is not the 80s or it's not the 70s. You know, it's kind of, probably women are far stronger in many ways than what men are at the moment. Yeah. Do you think that's just a cultural thing, like you just mentioned there, more than anything else? I think so. I think it's a cultural thing. I, I, I think so. 
I think so. But it, but it's a it's a cultural thing for minority. I think most people are on the same sort of page and wavelength where we are. That you know, women are equal. If not, there's certain businesses I think that we men couldn't do, which only they can do. Um, so, so no, I don't think they're any lesser than anybody else. Shalane, your plans for your daughters are for them. Do you want to see them as successful entrepreneurs then, or I'd like to see them sort of go over and beyond wherever I leave the empire. You grew up and you mentioned your dad, you know, had this military uh, sort of uh, style of uh, bringing you up and you saw the hardship and you experienced it. Now, obviously, Alhamdulillah, you're really successful. So my question to you is, how do you show your daughters or yeah, your children the life, that the hardship that you kind of experienced? Um, I only try to show them that verbally. I don't think it really sinks <laughs> yeah. because it's one of those things. Unless you've experienced it, you can't experience it. So it's like somebody growing up, uh, getting dropped off at school and picked up, and then they get to 18, they get a car, they've never experienced a bus. So yeah. if you try to tell them, look what a bus ride is like, they'll be like, yeah, okay, I get it, but I need to get my car. You know, so I don't think they'll totally understand. Um, some of the things are the way we grew, but how I look at it is, if I compare my childhood to my kids, Mine looks terrible compared to theirs. But then my parents were probably much worse than mine. So as each generation is growing, I think they're all getting their fair share, but less than the next one to come. That makes sense. And uh, in terms of your your own personality traits, uh, what kind of a personality would you say you have? I can see just from the key themes that have come out of this podcast, you're quite competitive. Uh, you're detail oriented when it comes to creating your USPs for your business and you're hard working and relentless uh, at the things that you go out and do. But what kind of personality traits would you say have really helped you get to where you are? I think the biggest one is the, the drive, the energy drive, um, knowing what I want um, and executing that well. That's been my biggest success. Um, waking up in the morning and, 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 and I thank the Almighty that I ended up in a business that I enjoy. To me, it's not a job. If I walked across the road now, that to me wouldn't be a workplace. It's like a social ground. For the sense, the staff is like family. The customers in there, you can see 80% of them, they're like my friends. So I don't feel like as if I'm working. It's like working, but I'm in my comfort zone. So enjoying that, having the drive, having the energy, that's what's been my drive. So you enjoy what you do and... Was you money motivated or what's your relationship like with money then? Or have you always been wanting to be a multimillionaire? I never ever thought in my life that I would be a rich man. I never saw myself. Growing up, I never saw myself as a rich man. Um, I'm going to tell you a little funny story, but this is how I ended up. It was well, This is what really drove me to um, opening my restaurant. On Leeds Road, there used to be a restaurant called Pekiza. Yeah. It used to belong to the Haq family. Tariq Haq, Shama Haq, and uh, Jamil Haq. And that was my last job before I opened my place. Now, I used to be a manager at Pekiza. I was very good. Tariq's dad, Allah Janam Sib Kare, Haji Sab was a fantastic guy. Uh, very strict. Stricter than my fra father. But principled man. And, but he liked me. He liked me because I was good at my job. So we had that good bond. We had that great, you know, employer-employee relationship. It worked well. I brought the results. He was happy. No problem. But he was the kind of guy that everybody was scared of. And the only thing that me and Haji Sabu ever clashed on was, because... Uh, my time was five o'clock to start and I'd walk in at five past and they'd be sat there reading newspaper on the go. <laughs> like, uh, 5.20. And I knew in my head, as much as this guy loves me, he's going to suck me. 
this is just it just can't be helped and uh, however um, I thought the only way out of this is if I were my own place I could probably be late a little bit it doesn't matter so that was one of the things that also pushed me a little bit um, it was one of the best guys that I actually I enjoyed working with Haji Mazar Saab um, and you know we had such a great relationship that he actually uh, I just had four sons and he used to call me his fifth son Mashallah. he wow. goes he's my fifth son and I still have that same love and compassion for Haji Saab till this day you know um, it was I enjoyed that was my last job that I really enjoyed working at and then you went to become an entrepreneur then I came and opened this place uh, the, the Akbars across the road would you say money buys you happiness or money buys you a lot of things I can't guarantee it'll buy you happiness yeah. but it can buy you a lot of things now then it depends if you're a material person and you want to buy a lot of things or not that's another question um, but it can help to make things easy for example it can buy you better health etc money can be used in so many good ways depends how you use it and what would you say your your passions are then i can see you've got a nice watch uh, you've got a beautiful watch collection like what what kind of things do you buy them i like nice cars uh, i've never been a jewelry man uh, but i like my watches um, i like a nice house nice cars you've got a beautiful house mashallah that, is that something that you always dreamed of or no I never had dream of be I never dreamt that I would become rich. I never dreamt of living in a house like that. I never dreamt of driving a Rolls Royce. I never dreamt of any of those things. I never dreamt of any of those things. I just wanted to be the best waiter to the best head waiter and then the best manager and then have a fantastic little restaurant. That's all I wanted, a fantastic little restaurant in Bradford. And I achieved that. Then, I, then at each stage, I gave myself the next challenge. And then achieving that, the next challenge. And that's how I built up. I never sort of says, right, I'm here and I want to be there. Yeah. No, it was, I just wanted to get from a waiter to a head waiter. To me, that was success. Achievement, done. And then you think, but because I like to challenge myself and I work better under challenge and, 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 and stress, it was always giving myself new goals. It's like my challenge now is, even though we've just come out of COVID, um, I'm going to open one restaurant a year. And that's up and down the country. And it's easily said, but it's but I'm going to do that, inshallah. Um, last year I did Newcastle. I housed Newcastle from, it was in one unit, but I moved it elsewhere too. So to me, it's a new restaurant. Yeah. This year, January, I've done, <coughs> so that was, excuse me. That was January last year, Newcastle. Uh, March this year, I've done Blackburn. Another, um, it's about 6,000 square foot, almost 200 seater restaurant, uh, which just opened about four weeks ago. Um, and next year, I'm going to find a new city, design that restaurant, build a team, work at it a few months then get ready for the next year. Is it still as exciting setting up a new restaurant at the level you're at now than versus the f early stages when it was a bigger thing? Or is it still the same? Do you still get that same buzz? Or? I still get that same buzz. Um, but it's much easier now because I've got a massive team behind me. But the excitement and the drive and the energy was more then. So now I can delegate more to other people. Um, but yeah, but the excitement's still the same. What's driving you now that you're successful? You're a multimillionaire, mashallah. You've got a successful brand. You don't really need any more restaurants. Like what drives you in the morning to wake up and go to work and have this goal of starting up a new restaurant? I think it's more just leaving a legacy, really. It's not so much about money. Because with, with the blessing of God, when you get to a certain point, and in that year, or at the end of the year, whatever you're looking at is figures. Just a number, yeah. So that number could be high or it could be no, low, but it doesn't matter to you because as long as you're fed, your roof's paid for, everything's done, it's just numbers. But it's more a legacy than anything else. So that's what you're now aiming for, is just to leave that legacy of, what's the legacy then? If you had to explain to listeners, 
and you want it to be remembered as something what do you want to be remembered as i want it to i want to be remembered as the first independent national chain of pakistani restaurants in the uk oh that's a big uh, big goal yeah well i suppose we're up to glasgow so if i did nottingham leicester london i'm pretty much there and then one in wales I'm done. I've done it all. So a few more years. For one restaurant a year. So five, five years, inshallah. It might take me more. It might take me five years. It might, might take me seven years. Because sometimes you have to be... For me, getting the location right is more important than sort of just quickly rushing into it. So it might happen in five years. It might happen in seven years, eight years. But that's the goal. Uh, do you ever have any difficulties of uh, restaurants you've tried to open up and maybe, not, maybe failed in or not succeeded in? Or Yeah, of course. I mean, look, nobody is invincible. Everybody has, no, because ultimately one thing we sometimes we must never forget that no matter how good you are, no matter how much of a role you're on, um, you have to be prepared, and which is quite good because sometimes we all need that little bit of humbling and we have to eat that humble pie. And sometimes things don't work out, even though you put everything into it. And that's maybe that's Allah Ta'ala's way of reminding us that, listen, stay in lane and remember who the real... Yeah. Do you ever feel like sometimes there's like pressure though now that you're you've built up this persona of being really successful and you've got the Akbar's brand that it comes with a lot of pressure as well? I always see it as a blessing from God. So whatever it is, it's a blessing and you have to accept it. If he has given so much good and if he throws something not so good, accept that as well. You know, you have to be grateful for and you can't forget all the goodness that you've had and all the kindness and all the all the mercy that you've had. Um, so, me personally, I would say accept whatever comes. So, who is the man behind the brand then? So, for people that are listening right now, they obviously see you, uh, they've heard of you, but uh, who's the actual man behind the brand and what kind of things are you into? Um, I like my fitness. Um, I, I'm a big sort of, uh, I wouldn't say gym freak, but I love my gym. I would have to make all my appointments work around the gym. Uh, but last sort of, couple of months I've been sort of suffering a bit of a hernia so I can't touch that and I'm so upset um, so no gym work um, gym table tennis I love uh, sort of you know physical activities um, and <coughs> I like to excuse me I like to take my regular breaks my kind of way of sort of getting inspirations and things is just work hard for a few months and then just maybe take a take four or five days away um, and that's kind of it, really. So looking after your health, eating healthy, um, and trying to sort of improve one thing a day at work. If I go to work and I tell myself, I need to change one thing today, just one. And this is what I tell all my managers. Just change one thing. Improve one thing. Whether it's, whether it's something to do with food, whether it's the style of the menu, whether it's something to do with the uniform, just change one thing. And if all my managers and me, we changed one thing a day, we'd have the best restaurant in a year. So I would say, when you go to work, when you go to your business, think of one thing you can improve. Oh, where did you learn that from? Is that just something you've always implemented? Uh, no. I learned that from uh, Mr. Schwaller. He was one of the um, teachers at the Bradford College um, for hotel and catering. And that was his motto. When you go to work, don't do go in and do the same thing day in, day out. Yes, customers in, customers out, feed them, pay, off you go, clean up. No. It's just, whilst you're there, just think of one thing that you can improve. Because that's exercise of the mind. And exercise of the mind and the body is what keeps you alive. And you're adding value to the business. So clever, I'll try and implement that into my life at yeah. some point and see how it goes. Any, any final bits of advice that you could give to our listeners that are starting up businesses, new entrepreneurs, uh, entrepreneurs of all sizes that look up to you, uh, what would you say to them if they are trying to aspire to, to be like you and achieve half the success that you've achieved? Um, I think if, you know, achieving what I've achieved or even achieving beyond what I've achieved is not 
difficult. It just depends on you, your drive, your product, your product knowledge, um, and your determination. This is the most important thing. This is the most important thing. And, and inshallah, things will work out. Um, people say, when you do dua, Allah Ta'ala never says no. Allah Ta'ala either says yes, or says maybe not now. Because he knows better. So persistence and patience. But keep working, keep working. The Dean played an important part in your life? or uh, To be honest with you, more recently than in the past, more recently, um, I don't know, but yes, recently it has. What are your thoughts on uh, this current generation where people always judge or they always have something negative to say or they look at people that are successful like yourself and it's so easy just to say uh, he got lucky or um, he did things a certain way. Now, what's your thoughts on that? Uh, good question. There was a, a sheikh and his assistant and they had a donkey. The sheikh was sat on the donkey. Yeah. The assistant was pulling it along. And they met a person and he says, hey, what are you doing? You should be ashamed of yourself making this poor fellow walk and you sat on the donkey. Sheikh thought, that sounds bad. So Sheikh got off the donkey, he put his associate onto the donkey. They're walking along. Somebody else comes along. And they say, Oi, what are you doing? You should be ashamed of yourself. Making Sheikh walk and he's riding. That's not right. So they came off. They're walking along. They said, what do we do now? So they go further along. They meet somebody else and somebody says, hello, what are you two doing? In this hot weather, drinking water, making this donkey walk. They said, well, what shall we do? We should carry the donkey. So Sheikh and his associates started carrying the donkey. So the moral of the story is, people are never happy. People will always have a bit to say. People have always got two pence worth. We call them keyboard warriors. A bit like people that sort of do a lot of sit at home, never played a game of football, but I've got much to say about the game and how poorly it was played. So I think a lot of it's about yourself. It's how you feel. It's what you know. Everything is between you and your maker. Because at the end, it's going to be you and your maker. Nobody else. So do they really matter? No. Because you can never please everyone. There's always, no. Someone's always got something to say. Yeah. And there's always haters and uh, people that look up to you. Um, so final bits that I want to conclude on. One of them is, you mentioned a little bit earlier on the podcast, is that you've got a really big social network of entrepreneurs and people that you network with so how what kind of advice could you give to people that want to go out and network with entrepreneurs and network and build <coughs> relationships like has that been really important for you and is there any advice you could give okay um in the beginning a restaurant is such a such such a business that if you want to build relationships or if you want to get to know people it's the perfect business why because in a successful restaurant you'll meet hundreds of people a day, people from all walks of life. And, and the people coming in actually want to meet you. They want to know. If they like your product, they actually want to know you. So it's very easy to meet people in net, uh, a network in restaurant. I'd say it is a networking place all the time um, because you don't know who you're talking to and you're talking to people from all walks of life. And... Uh for the future for yourself, then what 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 does uh, it hold for the Akbar's brand and Durrani's brand? Are you investing in any other businesses, or are these the just two of the main industries that you're in? Yeah, uh, well, I hope that uh, Mr. Durrani and uh, Samara, uh, I wish them good luck. I wish uh, them to have many more of these shops, just like we have many more of Akbar's. Yeah, and um, so whichever direction they grow. As for Akbar's, yes, there will be at least. Uh, another five, six, at least five, six, until I get to London. Um, and as for the jewellery shop, uh, that's for these guys. 
to see how much drive they've got and mm. uh, how fast they can move. And would you invest in any other industries? Or are they just your two main core focuses? Um, I like to sort of stick to what I know and yeah. keep it just sort of simple rather than just diverse, di- diversify into too many different areas. Okay, and any final pieces of advice to our our listeners uh, that are listening and look up to you? Um, well, I would say, um, I hope we've not bored you guys too much. <laughs> and um, really, I'd just like to say, I wish everybody good luck. I want you all to know that there is a lot of opportunity, even now, even under the, the current climate, there are a lot of opportunities, um, but for the right person with the right product and service, there's still a lot to be done. Yeah, what are your thoughts on the climate, though, just before we conclude? Uh, um, doing business in the UK, I know yeah, it's hard. Yeah. I mean, for example, I have uh, just opened, talking about climate, I've just taken uh, opened a restaurant, nearly 200-seater, four weeks ago. Mashallah, it is uh, full every night. Uh, I know it's just one service at the moment, it's just a thari, because people don't eat before or after that. Um, but yeah, um, it's great potential, and still... Uh, and wanting to continue and, and, and expand. So you're optimistic that there is a, a climate for successful businesses in the yes. UK? Yes, yeah, for the right product, for the right, for, for, for the right product, yes, there is, there always is. Um, you know, um, so long as it's kind of affordable and you're not selling some luxury uh, diamond branded jewellery, then yes, the climate might not be the brilliant one, but, but overall, but generally for a day-to-day use businesses, whether it's clothing, whether it's perfumes, whether it's food, there's always demand. Because people always want something new. They want the next best. They want the next best. And anyone wanting to get into the restaurant industry, I had a few people message and just say, ask, like, do you think for a new brand, so not an existing brand like Akbar's, is it possible to start up a new restaurant brand and, and succeed like it was back in the day? Or <coughs> is yes. it a lot harder? It is hard. But the hard is in a different way. It's harder, yet it's easier. And I'll, allow me to explain that. It's harder because the cost of everything now is far more than what we were paying then. The paperwork that in, that's involved in a day-to-day running of a restaurant is a lot harder than what it was then. But the social media that helps the new businesses now is far more powerful than any media we've ever had in the past. In the past, we've had to work with word of mouth, radios, newspapers, um, and TV we couldn't afford. So that was it. Now, I think the social media is just something else. It's such a tool. It can make you overnight. So if you've got the right product, it could possibly be easier. But I'm going to refer back to the Fat Boys story. That was hard work, social media, and they're flying. They've got it all together. They're flying. What's your thoughts on social media then? I think it's such a powerful tool. And I think every business should have it. As Akbar's, and I have to say, we've been a bit of a dinosaurs in that area. Uh, but we've started moving now. We have to. Uh, and there's no choice. There's no, there's no way out. It is the way forward. Yeah, I've seen that you've created a TikTok account. You're starting to get we quite a lot of attention. Yeah. Bit, yeah, yeah, we yeah. do a little bit on it now. So thank you very much for listening, guys. If you enjoyed it, feel free to uh, drop a like, comment, share down below. And we'll definitely do a part two where if you have any questions, just fire them at us. Thank you, guys. I hope you've enjoyed the uh, podcast. So it's, it's been nice to sit down with somebody like you for so long. It's... Uh, it's not easy to get hold of somebody like you and everyone looks up to you. So thank you for being on the channel. We really appreciate it. So another You're ex- welcome.